Um, greetings, everyone. My name is Sarah Jane Ahmed, V20 Finance Advisor and the Coordinating Editor of the Climate Vulnerability Monitor 3rd Edition. It is my pleasure to present the Climate Vulnerability Monitor series and the recently launched CVM3 in this important regional workshop. Let me start by introducing the CVF and the V20 group, which commissioned the CVM series. The CVF was established in 2009 as a voluntary non-treaty organization representing a collective voice of vulnerable developing countries with 12 founding members. The CVF established the V20 in October 2015, just two months before the Paris Agreement, in order to translate the political agenda into actual financing and the real economy. The V20 works towards enhancing access to finance as well as mobilizing new resources for climate vulnerable countries. The membership now stands at 58 countries representing 1.4 billion and 6% of global emissions. The CVF and the V20 is currently vested in the government of Ghana. The past presidencies which make up the Troika also include um, Bangladesh and the Marshall Islands. The Global Center on Adaptation is the managing partner and host of the Secretariat of the Climate Vulnerable Forum and the V20. The CVM series represents a unique global knowledge product and tool for responses to global climate change at international, regional, and national levels, providing one, explicit quantified information, estimates for the total impact of climate change in economic terms, two, in public health and ecological terms, and three, formulating practical policy recommendations. The CVM ultimately aims to promote more effective responses to the threats of climate change with variously and disproportionately affect certain populations, communities, and economies. The third edition uh, was commissioned by the CVF and the V20, working with Climate Analytics, FinRes, and the Lancet Countdown, and the CVF V20 Secretariat hosted in the GCA. This formed the consortium of organizations contributing to the CVM3 and is also supported by dedicated expert panels and regional partners. The CVM3 is a unique global assessment at the national level of present and potential future climate change impacts on the environment, economy, and public health. The monitor consolidates the latest research from the scientific literature on the attribution of climate change in 32 distinct indicators of socioeconomic and environmental change and impact phenomena. The monitor projects and compares how far and wide range of countries, these impacts evolve through the 21st century under a climate and socioeconomic scenario that limits warming to 1.5 Celsius versus below 2 Celsius scenario, and a high emission scenario without climate action to reduce emissions or mobilize additional adaptation efforts. The CVM3 development is guided by different knowledge partners, starting with the research consortium, to contact groups, to regional partners, and their respective expert reviewers, which include one to two think tank research groups or institutions across 12 world regions that are mandated to provide inputs, develop regional studies derived from the new monitor's assessment, and ensure dissemination among target groups of countries in each region, which is why we, ha we are having this event today. And uh, then we have the publication partners. Um, moving on to the overview of the methodology, the CVM3's global assessment of impact of climate change in estimated uh, climate attributable loss and damage comprises three distinct bodies of work with, with each developed by a lead member of the Monitor's Research Consortium. The biophysical and socioeconomic impact analysis is led by climate analytics, the human health impact analysis led by the Lancet Countdown, and the macroeconomic impact analysis led by FinRes. The GCA and the CVF V20 Secretariat are responsible for the overall coordination and editorial leadership of the CVM3. The biophysical impacts of climate of climate change uh, looks into 19 indicators of impact in biophysical terms, including temperature changes, drought, precipitation, and runoff or discharge, wind speed, soil moisture, and crop yield. Climate change and health section lists 10 indicators of impact on human health, including infectious disease and exposure to risk like heat, wind, uh, wildfires, and food insecurity. Lastly, the macroeconomic consequences of climate change lists three indicators on GDP per capita growth, inflation, and interest rates. 
Each section of the monitor has been developed according to a specific methodology developed by respective partners, which are further discussed in the report. Each of the three CVM3 sections have aligned on common scenarios and the 21st century timeframes as explained in the next slide. So based on the latest scenarios developed for the IPCC sixth assessment report, the CVM3 assessed potential impacts of climate change across different sectors using three scenarios and three time slices with a baseline from 1995 to 2014. In terms of the near-term impact, uh, the impacts are assessed for a 20-year period, 2021 to 2040, um, centered around the year 2030. The midterm 2050 impacts are assessed for a 20-year period, 2041 to 2060, centered around in the year 2050. End of century is 2090. Impacts are assessed for a 20-year period, 2081 to 2100, centered around the year 2090. The 1.5C scenario in line with the temperature limit specified in the Paris Agreement, uh, the report assesses impacts in a scenario that assumes temperatures stabilize around a median warming of 1.5 C based on the results out of the SSP 126 scenario in the near term 2030. Below the 2 C scenario, the scenario is based on the results of the SSP 126 scenario, which leads to the best estimate of 1.8 uh, Celsius by the end of century. No, the no climate action scenario is based on the SSP 370 results this higher warming scenario would lead to a median warming of 3.6 degrees Celsius by the end of the century above the estimated temperature that current climate policies would achieve. With that, I'll move to the next slide um, in order to highlight uh, some of the key findings of the report. So for biophysical and, and socioeconomic impacts, uh, one of the main findings is that climate impacts are being observed across the world and negative impacts of climate change can be seen across natural and human systems. Currently, around 85% of the global population live in areas that are already experiencing significant change in temperature and precipitation. It is very important to note that these numbers are likely underestimating the true extent of damage. The report highlights that the most vulnerable regions remain less visible in scientific analysis of impacts, despite the growing literature base. Uh, what the report also shows is much clarity is that climate impacts increase with every fraction of warming. So every degree of warming adds mounting losses and damages from climate change. And this also increases the challenges to adaptation, especially for most vulnerable regions. So even at 1.5 degrees of warming, vulnerable countries are likely to struggle to adapt to climate impacts as they are already very severe. The report also makes it very clear that limiting warming to 1.5 C will minimize negative impacts that will be experienced. One of the examples presented on this slide is that in a 1.5 degree scenario, the number of drought events in all regions of the world over a 20 year period is projected to increase four to eight fold by 2050 when compared to current baseline. In a below two degree scenario, which would still not achieve emission reductions that are compatible with the Paris Agreement, this would rise between five to 11 times. And under the no climate action scenario, this would rise to 12 to 14 times more frequent droughts. Um, finally, uh, it is clear that Climate change also affects the socioeconomic conditions that determine the actual vulnerability on the ground and influence the overall level of climate risk in the regional space. The 1.5 degree scenario compared to the mild climate action scenario leads to drastically different outlooks in terms of socioeconomic conditions by the end of the 21st century. So the Paris Agreement's 1.5 temperature limit is not critical only for reducing negative impacts of climate change, but it is also essential to spur improved socioeconomic conditions and to achieve uh, the UN Sustainable Development Goals. In this context, the very important aspect of adaptation and, ad and adaptation support was also assessed, as this is of course, essential to reduce the impacts of climate change that we face even at present day levels, but of course, also at 1.5 degrees of warming and associated impact. What we see is that progress to is being made in adaptation planning and also in implementation, but it is very uneven across sectors. 
and most uptake is documented in economic and technological sectors. Um, so again, to sum up briefly, losses and damages are the consequence of climate change um, and are occurring today and will continue to increase. And these impacts are often felt most acutely by the most vulnerable regions uh, and population groups whose underlying socioeconomic conditions exacerbated increasing climate hazards. Um, and the report really highlights that the global responsibility to enable the most vulnerable to cope with these effects through adaptation and through building resilience. For the climate change and health section, uh, one of the most concerning impacts of climate change is the increase in exposure of, of vulnerable populations to heat waves and associated increase in heat-related mortality. Without further um, adaptation, uh, heat-related mortality could increase up to 1,550% um, uh, with 3 million annual deaths um, if we did not take action by the uh, end of the century. However, perhaps the biggest message is that we could save 91% of those deaths if we are to take climate action today and limit warming to 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial times. These impacts do not manifest themselves uniformly around the world, and we see that the most affected regions are expected to be South Asia, with enormous increases in exposure to extremes of heat and associated heat-related mortality, and the poorest hottest areas of the world are, of course, expected to see unlivable heat conditions. Infectious disease is another area where climate change is becoming a great concern by changing the temperature, humidity, rainfall patterns. We're also, see, we're also starting to see its effect um, and exposure to climate-sensitive infectious diseases. As an example of that is the risk of dengue transmission. We're evaluating the extent to which the changing whether we um, we increase the um, the reproduction potential of dengue and therefore exposing populations to emerging risks, as you see in the map, even under a 1.5 degree compatible scenario, areas that today are endemic and today and where today dengue is a disease of public health concern, like South America, Africa, Southeast Asia. We'll see the potential of transmission of dengue ever increasing even under a 1.5 degree scenario. As we approach two degrees, this increase is much exacerbated. If we were not to take any climate action, we would see enormous increases in South America, Asia, and particularly Southeast Asia. But perhaps um, it's important to note that Areas that today are free from disease, like in North America and Europe, would start seeing conditions that would be increasingly suitable for outbreaks of dengue. So we are talking about emerging diseases and new populations being exposed to diseases that today were considered relatively protected from. There is also a decrease, as you can see in the blue, some areas that show a relative decrease in what we consider today to be a risk of dengue. But it's important to note that the vector, the mosquito and the pathogen, uh, the virus can both adapt to changing conditions once they're established. So this is um, what was modeled today, but the biology of pathogen and the transmission is set to change. So this is just to highlight that it's not um, that we would be safer in those areas, um, or at least not that we know of. Um, for the extreme weather events, uh, there will be hotter conditions in many parts of the world, and one of the particular concerns with the situation is increasing exposure to wildfires uh, that we know affects our health. The CVM3 monitored the change in the population exposure to wildfire or risk or the days of very high wildfire risk. Once again, the pattern is very similar under the 1.5 degree compatible scenario. Uh, there will also be an increase in the exposure of populations to days, uh, to days of high wildfire risk, particularly in hotter latitudes. Under the two-degree scenario towards the end of the century, this increases. But if we were not to take climate action, we would see an enormous increase, particularly in Africa and, air, and hotter areas of Central America in the Middle East um, in terms of exposure to wildfire. So this poses acute health risks that need to be managed and mitigated. And finally, turning into climate change and food insecurity, we know that climate change is already 
today affecting global food security. The data shows that heat wave increases we've seen over the past few decades have resulted in almost um, 100 million more people still reporting food insecurity today. Um, perhaps a particular concern is that some of the areas of the world which today are already suffering from acute insecurity like many African countries such as Sierra Leone, Liberia, Central um, African Republic, Somalia, and other uh, low human development index countries are set to see the highest increases in food insecurity relating to increasing temperatures. So again, while no countries, while no countries are exempt, we can see that the Nordic countries uh, are being highly affected by increasing food insecurity. It is once again, those most vulnerable countries generally in hotter at altitudes um, that are going to see the effects the most. Um, and if we go to the next slide in terms of key takeaways um, from the health sector of this report, um, we are seeing that climate driven health risks increasing are increasing in all future scenarios and that includes the 1.5 degree scenario. What that is telling us is that increased adaptation is crucial to protect the most vulnerable populations from the exacerbated health impacts, which we are seeing already today. The second key message is that increasing health impacts of climate change will be seen across the whole world in all countries. However, as we have heard already, the most vulnerable countries will be the most deeply affected. And that is unless there's urgent action taken today to promote a just transition. And finally, we're seeing the accelerated climate action today can still prevent the most catastrophic event of, of climate impacts in the near term, medium term, and long term. And moving now into macroeconomic uh, consequences of climate change, um, we're seeing that climate change related disasters negatively affect economic growth and also escalate inflation across countries. Since both these indicators um, economic growth and inflation are key parameters influencing the definition of interest rates by central banks. The report also shed some light on the potential consequences of climate change on the cost of borrowing across countries. What we see in terms of GDP per capita is decreases in GDP per capita growth that will lead to lower incomes across all countries, with some countries especially located in Central Asia facing up to 30% decrease in growth potential. And then with more frequent precipitation extremes affecting countries, um, price is also projected to increase across all nations. And the study finds that um, inflationary trends from limited level below 1% in median in North and South America to the near term to 2.4% in Asia and Africa and the long term. So what we see currently on this map um, is aggregated across uh, the continents. Um, as a response to more variable GDP growth and also increasing inflation, interest rates are also projected to increase across all regions. What we found, for example, is uh, measured in basis points, um, and this is a, a measure of interest rates. So we find that the median interest rates climb up 60 um, basis points in the Asian continent, for example, by the end of the century. The second set of information that we find coming out of this report is that keeping global mean temperature below 1.5 will have large macroeconomic benefits on average across all continents. Um, the additional 0 0.5 degree of warming by reaching two degrees would lead to more than doubling in negative macroeconomic consequences of climate change on, in on incomes compared to those observed at the 1.5 um, Celsius of warming. So in terms of key takeaways from the macroeconomic section of the report is that there will be increased macroeconomic consequences from climate change from low to high income countries by the end of the century. As highlighted in the biophysical and health sectors, uh, northern economies are not immune to the negative consequences of climate change. We expect lower than expected incomes across all nations and higher inflation that together will translate most likely in a depreciation of people's living conditions. Combined with increasing interest rates, governments and households will have a limited ability to invest in sustainable development, mitigation, and adaptation at the required scale. Finally, 
for all macroeconomic indicators, keeping global temperature below 1.5 C is the best policy against catastrophic loss and damage. So to summarize, the main finding of the CVM3 is that climate change impacts generate loss and damage that are creating crises for society, human health, and development globally. The asymmetric impact of climate change deepens global inequalities and injustice, and nobody is spared. In the near term, the world should brace for a rapid escalation in climate shocks. Absent of climate action, end of century impacts dwarf climate shocks to date, while limiting to 1.5 C will prevent a potentially massive expansion in climate impacts beyond 2030. Accelerated adaptation action and efforts to address loss and damage will be essential to managing the climate crisis. Finally, increased investment in knowledge and data will be will continue to prove crucial to further refining understanding of the nature of the crisis and effective responses and strategies going forward. Um, thank you. Uh, for any questions or comments, you know, feel free to email us at secretariat at v20.org. Thank you.